by uh, Johannes Degemeyer. Yeah, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the organizers for inviting me, giving me the opportunity to present our work here. And thanks to Rosario for throwing this ball to me. So, of course, this is a love story, but every love story needs a bit of drama. And here, so it's the drama aspect of uh, basically the dynamics of uh, longer shoot with molecules, um, their, uh, their lifetime in decay. Um, so, a brief um, um, overview over the, the zoo of Rittberg molecules. So, let me point out that all these different types of Rittberg molecules, these are all just different regions in phase space of a dimer, typically homonuclear dimers. So, typical chemistry is down here. If you excite a normal molecule like H2 or so into a Rittberg state, you end up here. And the long range middle molecules that we discuss here, they're localized out here in a very specific space uh, in phase space where the separation of the two nuclei is comparable or the same size as the size of the Rydberg orbit. So that's why we can describe this in the scattering language. If both Rydberg atoms are excited and the orbitals do not overlap, we have macrodimers, which are bound by long range van der Waals interactions. So this is again more like uh, classical chemical molecules, and if we go uh, farther up, then there are these uh, iron Rydberg atom molecules that, that Georg mentioned yesterday, where uh, one is ionized. Um, and we focus, or I focus here, on the long range Rydberg molecules. And uh, I continue the, the motivation that, that Barry gave yesterday and, and other people why these are interesting. So, this is like the physics view of um, what's interesting there. So one thing is, uh, we have to note that this minimum, the wave, the vibration wave function in that minimum is localized very strongly at, uh, at a large internuclear distance. So you really, if you excite, if you form this by photosensation, you, you probe a very narrow region of internuclear separations. And you can use this, or this was used to probe pair correlations here in the group of Thomas Gillian and Barry to see bunching and anti-bunching for uh, fermionic or bosonic species of strontium. Um, and then this picture, you know, from our book of abstracts um, that, that indicates the interesting polaron physics once you have many perturbers within the orbit of the Rydberg electron. There is another side to it that was also mentioned, I would call this more the chemist side. Um, there is interesting aspects of non-adiabatic dynamics, especially if you consider the principal quantum number n, that you can do easily. A continuous variable and treat it as a synthetic dimension. Even in a dimer, you can now span that two dimensional space by a principal quantum number and internuclear separation. And in that uh, synthetic space, you have conical intersections um, that have a strong influence on uh, the decay dynamics, L changing collisions that, that was proposed recently and that should be observable in experiments. Um, what we are interested, well, the, the aspect that we are mostly interested in is the, the prospect to form ultra cold pair plasmas. So, a plasma that is overall neutral with uh, particles of opposite charge that have the same mass. So, C plus, C zero minus. That makes the dynamics very slow, observable, and because we start cold and with equal mass, um, we expect to have an ultra cold plasma here. So, um, that this is a, a good way to do, um, or a promising way to do something that, that we proposed, and also uh, Hossi, um, Peter, and co-workers. Um, and so, basically, this is the main motivation for I will, what I will present. So, this is the outline. It's maybe slightly optimistic. We'll see how far ahead. Um, so, we'll brief on the spectroscopy and modeling of longer schmidt molecules because Matt made all the important uh, comments on this. Um, and then I will focus on like experimental details of uh, dynamics and detection of long range triplet molecules that turn out to be not so detailed but, but rather important. Um, and then this is an uh, outlook of what we are currently doing the mid infrared spectroscopy of these long range triplet molecules once they are formed. Um, so uh, I'll basically continue the discussion of Matt now with a uh, focus on experiments. So. How do you get these um, binding energies that he mentioned? So you start with an ultra cold gas. In that gas, particles collide. And if in that scattering state, that pair absorbs uh, a photon, it can form an excited molecular state. 
And so you change the energy of this photon, and whenever this uh, is resonant, you observe that you excite this molecule, you spectroscopically probe it and form it at the same time. And the detuning of that resonance from the atomic asymptote gives you directly the binding energy. So with this method, you can very accurately determine uh, binding energies without the, the, the threshold energy. <laughs> the experimental setup, we do this uh, a simple magneto-optical trap setup uh, with electrodes to apply correction fields for stray electric fields and field ionization. We detect charged particles that will be important later. We form molecules with a single UV photon going from the ground state to a Rydberg state directly. Um, and we do radio frequency spectroscopy of these molecules once they are formed. So if you do this, typical experimental results look like this. Here the lasers on the atomic transition, it's a very strong laser, you get a lot of signal, and as you detune it to the red, you see in that uh, signal that we'll discuss in more detail, many resonances. And interpreting this complex resonance structure in terms of the simple phase shifts that just made that, that simple behavior um, that match out, this is the, the challenge. Um, so to measure these bindings energies accurately, we need a stable laser system. So uh, we have a ring dye laser that is stabilized via reference cavity and electronic sideband locking to an atomic reference. And we have a residual drift of this system of 100 kilohertz per day. So that gives us about the resolution with which we can measure binding energies. Um, so this is uh, the Hamiltonian that we use to model the system. It, an uh, earlier version proposed by, uh, by Matt and Chris Green. Um, and so the contributions are roughly ordered uh, by their magnitude. So we have the Fermi contact interaction, which turns out to be the smallest energy scale for the, in the region where we work. Then we have the Rydberg spin orbit interaction, very surprisingly, the hyperfine interaction of the ground state atom is the largest energy scale that's very important for the dynamics. Um, and all the physics um, is in here because quantum defects, hyperfine splittings, fine structure splittings, and so on, we can measure uh, very well. So all the relevant uh, information about the uh, binding is in these um, scattering phase shifts. So uh, while waiting for the perfect theory uh, to calculate all this, uh, we develop our effective model. Um, and again, referring to Matt, it's important that the model that you use to calculate your phase shifts from an electron neutral interaction potential uh, has some physical meaning to it, that it's a meaningful model, that uh, all the scaling with energies, principal quantum numbers, angle momentum, and so on, then, then work out that you have some predictive power with the effective parameters that you extract. And so we use the best, I would say, available to the potential for the electron atom scattering that was developed by Kushtivatze and Paprika and co-workers. I thought that it's an explicit a relativistic potential um, where the spin orbit coupling, the spin orbit coupling of the motion of the electron around the perturber um, with the spin is explicitly taken into account with this operator. Um, the, this parameterization is somewhat um, empirical um, that um, came up over years as being uh, good and reasonable. Um, and if we do this for these four relevant channels, then actually we have 14 parameters. So it sounds like a large number of degrees of freedom, um, but actually these potentials, these phase shifts should also reproduce the measured electron affinity, probability of cesium, and the measured P1 shape resonance. So it's not completely arbitrary. Then we implement the cycle that we solve this scattering problem numerically. We extract phase shifts out of that. We go with this into the electronal Hamiltonian that <coughs> is solved by numerical diagonalization in the two phases, uh, fixed. Then we solve for the nuclear motion in these potential energy curves. Um, we simulate the spectrum, compare it to the experiment, and then iterate until we obtain uh, phase shifts that accurately reduce our experiment. So the question is, uh, I guess something that was pointed out in the question, um, how well does this work um, for, for our experiment? So we optimized the parameters here for 31p. So here you see an experimental spectrum and below a simulated spectrum. Um, and by now we have uh, 
improved it a bit further, but you see that, that uh, there is a good agreement, uh, qualitative and quantitative. And with this uh, phase shifts, we calculate now without further adjustments um, the spectrum for 40p and compare it with the experiment. Um, and we see that, I mean, there, there are slight shifts, but the structure is reproduced uh, at least accurately on our level of, of, of line width and of, of precision. And this is how uh, actually such a calculation looked like. So these are potential energy curves in all the different electronic symmetries, which are um, open in the system. Um, and these are just some of the vibrational eigenstates. So just for, for these uh, states um, that we obtain by a Milne phase amplitude method that is very robust to calculate all these bound states with, with random dynamics and so on. And because we have now this, um, this good agreement um, of the of spectral assignment scaling over many principal quantum numbers, we are quite confident that if we predict here a resonance, for example, is, so this is the calculation of 440 at minus 26, and we have this resonance here, that this uh, resonance in the spectrum actually means that we form a molecule here uh, in that minimum of the outer well at the separation of 2400 Bohr radii. And we can interpret these smaller resonances here as arising from the formation of, of molecules in these uh, more inner well, um, inner, inner wells that have butterfly character. So they have a larger contribution from uh, wave scattering of the electron from the perturber. Um, and so this gives an accurate description over a large range of principal quantum numbers and energy. So from 26, basically up to infinity for P and for D states. Um, but we know that it does not work for S states. For Cesium, S states are close to the ionogenic manifold. They have a large trilobite character. Um, and there we would need to determine different uh, scattering parameters, effective parameters. So in that sense, we're still looking forward to, uh, to that uh, more detailed, uh, precise theory being done. Um, so talk about the dynamics of the uh, photo association. Um, so how do we actually detect signal? So one is pulse field ionization. So a longish molecule is formed. We ionize it. By ionizing, we remove the electron. And the electron was all that was providing the binding. So the molecule dissociates. And we detect a positively charged ion in a time of light at a certain time. Another process that is very important, at least for the states that we work with, is molecular autoionization. So that state decays via chemistry. Um, into a cesium-2 plus ion that arrives at a later time and we can easily separate the two. Now, this is then a spectrum in these two channels. So here, looking at this PFI channel, integrating the first peak, or this molecular channel, integrating the second peak, and you see that we get complementary information from the two. So, for example, this state at minus uh, 26 megahertz is very strong in the PFI signal, but basically almost nothing in the season two plus. We can understand this, we can extract lifetimes from this. Um, it's nice. So uh, a simple test is now to just make our pulse longer. So instead of a six microsecond photo association pulse, we make it 27, so uh, a factor of three and a half something. Uh, and this spectrum looks identical, right? So here we go up to one, here we go up to four, so just about uh, Three to four times more. But here it looks very different. So this strong peak here goes from 5 to 18, perfect. But this one here goes from 1 to 8 or 10, so there's clearly some nonlinear going on. And that process um, we could identify as ion facilitated excitation. So what's happening here? We start here with this process B. We have now a cesium 2 plus ion in our sample. And that ion modifies, because it has an electric field, it modifies the excitation spectrum of the surrounding atoms. Um, and these states, the atomic states, they blue shift. These are calculated stark shifts for uh, the two um, projections. And remember that our laser that forms molecule is parked here at a red detuning of, of something like 40 megahertz. So in a shell, atoms surrounding that ion now become resonant and are excited into a And this is a signal identical to the one from, from PFI. But at the moment where we ionize, actually there is um, nothing left, no LRM left. 
Um, we do a rate model for this by just looking here, for example, at these two residences where we include all these mechanism formation of um, mythical decay to dimers um, and a facilitation rate. So this, um, with what uh, probability this happens. Um, and it describes our uh, dynamics that we observe quite well. Um, this model now allows us to extract the real fraction of long range filtering molecules that is still there when we probe our system, when we detect. And this is this green curve. And you see that it's almost nada. So there is nothing. So there are no LRMs basically left, although we have very uh, nice signals. So for any further prospects of doing something, this is, of course, um, a bit of a problem. So anyway, there's interesting physics. So we look at this facilitation rate, how it depends on the binding energy and the plausibility of a Rydberg state, and it gives us a facilitation radius that depends, as I said, on the plausibility and the binding energy of the long-range Rydberg molecule. Um, and then the facilitation rate should be just proportional to the volume of this shell assuming homogeneous density. And then we get the scaling of roughly one over the binding energy squared. And indeed, from the extracted rates from our rate model, we see that for these two different states that follow this trend very nicely. Uh, I note that this facilitation rate scales with the 16th power of the principal quantum number because the polarizability scales with the seventh power and the binding energy uh, with the inverse sixth power. Um, so if you do experiments with highly excited uh, long range feedback molecules, um, that can become a very important process. And we can also probe directly the composition of the sample by using um, RF spectroscopy. Um, so if we have a molecule and we shine in radio frequency at the right frequency, we can dissociate this molecule into now a three atom in a D state and a ground state atom. And because the binding energy, depending on the binding energy, this frequency changes, um, all the signals should lie here on the curve in this 2D plot where I have laser detuning versus RF detuning. Uh, if we have a facilitated atom, basically that transition frequency is always the same. And so from this uh, measurement, we can extract that all these states in that window are actually uh, only facilitated atoms left. And only here at this resonance, we still have long with molecules when we probe the system. And so I think I have like a few minutes Two minutes left, so I will be brief on this. So the motivation is to transfer now this long range feedback molecule state into an ion pair state by just driving that stimulation, that stimulated transition down into phase space of homonuclear dimers, um, and then transform this gas of long range feedback molecules into a gas of ion pairs. Um, so we built up a laser system for that um, that gives us nice pulses tunable in the relevant range. We can calibrate the frequency of that. Um, and then, actually, we, we, we have to look at what happens if you have, have now the sample with facilitated atoms, longer shifted molecules, and cesium-2 ions, and then you shine an infrared laser at it. And a lot of things happen, making the analysis at the moment very complicated. Um, so we, we detect additionally now ions that arrive very early. So these are ions that are already present when we apply the um, electric field ramp and we call them prompt. And we'll just focus uh, in the last uh, few seconds or so on this, um, um, on this channel. So the cesium-2 dimer that is stably formed in the ground state um, can be dissociated by our mid-infrared pulse and produces now a free pair of an ion and an atom. And we see this if we, if we look uh, for different delay times between the mid-infrared pulse and uh, our detection ramp, we see this, that in the time of light spectra, we have these uh, uh, wings coming out that uh, from a simulation we can attribute to fast ions, which the energy is compatible with that picture. So the mid infrared is doing something with our sample, it's a sample but not yet uh, what we want. Um, and so this is just uh, looking at the signals here. There are also some mysteries, but more or less the loss of season two is compatible with the increase in fast season plus. So I skipped the summary and just uh, thank the people that did the work, Michael Pepper, who is now in Princeton with Jeff Thompson, Martin Troutman, the postdoc, and uh, several students that contributed in projects to the work. Thank you.
Ja, so the long range feedback molecule you can either photo ionize with a uh, from slow ion, um, or you can create that ion pair state. Um, and of course, these are competitive uh, processes. And the calculations that, that we did, rather from the estimates, um, that should be suppressed by at least a factor of 20. Um, yeah, but this photoionization, the difference between the photoionization of LRMs and atoms is also something that we look at because there seems to be actually a difference in the weights. Well, thank you.